allow me to pray for our time in the Word together this morning. Father, we are grateful to be together, and we're grateful that you've given us the Word of God. And so, Father, we are praying that you would use it mightily in our minds and our hearts this morning. We know that the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to impact the people of God. And so we believe that you have a specific word for us this morning, a way to encourage us, a way to convict us, a way for us to see Jesus more clearly, that indeed he is God. And help us to have eyes of faith to see it and hearts to believe in it and, and the motivation to live life as a result of it. We give our time to you. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I think it's appropriate for me to start this morning with confession. I'm a man who can see, but at times cannot see. I'm a man who can hear, but often does not hear. And this is a condition I've had for a number of years, certainly since I was a young man. I distinctly remember my father telling me to go down to the garage and grab him a tool from the shop. And I kid you not, I remember standing there saying to myself, if my dad says the tool's here, then it's got to be here. Often I'd actually have him describe the size and color and potential location where that tool would be so that I'd have a better chance of actually seeing the tool and being able to bring it to him. Yet I'd stand there, often looking for long periods of time, looking, even staring, head moving from side to side, sweeping back and forth, right to left, left to right, looking, searching, scanning, and yet nothing. I could see nothing at all. And of course, he would come walking into the garage, march right past me, and grab the tool from the pegboard hook right in front of my face, literally inches from my nose, and say, it's right here. Yet for some reason, I couldn't see it. Fortunately, the same was true for my hearing. Now, this Feedback, as I'm sure you could guess, often came from my mom, telling me she'd been calling me for hours or had told me a million times to do this or to not do that. Yet somehow I had absolutely no recollection of hearing a word she said. For some reason, I truly hadn't heard her at all. Just for the record, both my mom and dad are here this morning from Wisconsin visiting. They can confirm all of these facts are true, and I'm sure they have a number of other stories that they could share with you. And I'd really love to say that things improved when I got married. <laughs> but unfortunately, that's not the case. Instead, now I stand in front of the refrigerator looking for ranch dressing, who my wife tells me is there. And I stand there often looking for long periods of time, <laughs> looking, staring, head moving back and forth. And it, sh it should be here, right to left, left to right, one shelf at a time. I got nothing. <laughs> she walks over, right there, in front of your face, ranch dressing. And it's very possible that this is a hereditary condition. Because <laughs> my boys seem to have the exact same problem. But more importantly this morning, for our purposes, is the fact that many of us have the exact same problem spiritually speaking. Not just unbelievers, but believers as well where we can see the things that Jesus has done in the Word of God and yet not really see them or see Him for who He truly is. So we're dull and we're distracted. We believe in Jesus, but we can't see Him with eyes of faith. We don't see what God is often doing in and through our lives. So even the things He's doing right in front of our Faces we miss and we can't see. 
And as we'll see, that's exactly what's going on with the disciples. Having eyes to see, but not really seeing Jesus with eyes of faith. Having ears to hear, but not really listening in a way that profits them spiritually. So our passage will serve for us as a warning. To not be like the disciples, to not be dull and distracted, but to be overwhelmed anew in the fact that Jesus is God. We know that to be true, but we need to know it in a new way this morning. And the reality that he's God, and yet he willingly laid down his life for our salvation. That he came to be our good shepherd, that he came to be the bread of life for us. That's where we're going this morning. So if you would, go ahead and open your Bibles with me. We're going to be in Mark chapter 6. It's on page 841. If you're using one of the Bibles under the chairs. If you didn't bring a Bible this morning, I very much encourage you to grab your Bible from below the chair. Open the Mark chapter 6, page 841, grab my bulletin insert. There's the outline for where I'm going this morning. Many of you like something to write down, want to follow the progress of the sermon, know that I'm actually moving forward. Conclusion is coming sometime. It's always helpful. I understand that. Good. Follow along as I read Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 44. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. Now this is obviously a very familiar story. Jesus feeding the five thousand certainly want to make sure we see what the disciples see, but I also want to make sure that we see what the disciples did not see. Let's start with what the disciples did see. They obviously saw Jesus attempt at a retreat, right? Verse 30 tells us that the disciples returned from a very busy season of ministry. We know from last week they were called and commissioned to go out in pairs to preach the gospel, calling people to repent, and were casting out demons and healing the sick. So no doubt they're excited And they're exhausted all at the same time, reporting to Jesus all that they had done and said. And in response, Jesus says, verse 31, Come away with me to a desolate place so that we can rest a while. Why is that? Well, because many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. So this is a very busy ministry season. Let me just pause for a moment of application. Because Jesus makes it clear, doesn't he, that rest is a very good thing. In fact, he's recommending it to the disciples. In our crazy, non-stop, action-filled, no rest, no breaks, no margins kind of busy lifestyle, 
We need to be reminded of that fact. That rest and relaxation, relaxation is a very good and godly thing. One pastor I was listening to said, sometimes the most godly thing to do is to take a nap. I mean, my goodness, God is the one who created rest, didn't he? Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. But even in that, recognize that God created the Sabbath, a whole day of rest, but created it so that you might know that he is God and that he is worthy of our worship. Second thing I want you to notice here is that Jesus actually never rested. I mean, yes, that was his intention, right? Got all his disciples into the boat, headed off to a desolate place by themselves, alone. Rest and relaxation is the goal. But then what happened? Verse 33. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. So when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. Now isn't that absolutely crazy? I mean, I can't help... But picture this boat heading across the Sea of Galilee, Jesus and his disciples going to some Christian camp on the other side, and yet all they see along the banks is these people running, like, like a stampede, trying there to get, trying to get there ahead of them. And how does Jesus respond when he arrives? Does he get mad? Does he get irritated? Does he say, listen, folks, this is ridiculous? I can't possibly work all the time. No, I need a little downtime. I need a little me time, a little Jesus recover and recuperation time. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that at all. And again, I I think this is a much needed application for us. It's not like there's anything wrong with rest. And relaxation. I just highlighted how it's a good and godly thing to do to rest. But that's obviously not the number one priority. Instead, Jesus gladly sets aside rest in order to minister the gospel to these people. And I'm wondering if we have that kind of priority. That we will gladly set aside free time, me time, date time, game time, or personal time in order to serve and sacrifice for others. You know, I often think we're happy to serve and sacrifice just as long as it hits our schedule at a time that works well for us. Or if it's planned far enough in advance because we don't like surprise serving opportunities. That if there's a personal conflict, there's just no way in the world that it's going to happen. And yet you don't see that attitude at all in Jesus. In fact, I think it's so funny that almost every Christian camp or retreat center that I've ever been to in the history of my life, every single Christian camp or retreat center puts this phrase above their front sign. Come away to a desolate place and rest a while. And yet, (laughs) in the context, right, Jesus never rested. He said he canceled the retreat so that he could minister the gospel. In fact, verse 34 says, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. I want you to notice that Jesus is ministering to these folks' spiritual needs. So he's teaching them many things, no doubt, right? The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Verse 35 says that when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place. Hour is late. Send these people away so they can go buy something to eat. What's the problem? Well, the problem's obvious. You've got a hungry crowd in the middle of nowhere. Notice how the text tells us three times this is a desolate place. They're in the middle of the wilderness. Jesus knows it. The disciples know it. 5,000 men know it, which means there's probably 20,000 people here who know this is a desolate place. They're hungry, and there's no food. So there's this massive, obvious, apparent problem. And I think the disciples' solution is totally legitimate. Send them away. Let them fend for themselves, buy their own food, and eat and be satisfied. 
But then Jesus throws this monkey wrench in the plan, doesn't he? He says, verse 37, you give them something to eat. Of course, the disciples immediately jump to the physical. Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread? Which, by the way, would have been the equivalent of 200 days wages worth of bread. I have an engineering background. I thought I would do some calculations on this so you could understand this, right? If there's 260 working days in 2019, which there are, 200 days is about 75%. If you earn $65,000 per year, that's $50,000 worth of bread. That's a lot of bread. (laughs) That's option number one. Not a great option, (laughs) but a possibility. What does Jesus do instead? He takes five loaves of bread, two fish, commands everyone to sit down, looks up to heaven and prays, and then starts distributing the food. Verse 42 says, they all ate and they were all satisfied. What does that mean? It means they didn't take two fish and cut it to 20,000 little different pieces, right? This isn't little fish snacks. They're all eight. They all were satisfied. The disciples are obviously the ones who distributed the food, collected the leftovers. Verse 43 says there's 12 baskets full, so there's more baskets at the end than they started with. They saw all of that. What did they see? They saw the attempt at the retreat, they saw the problem of a hungry crowd, and they saw the miracle of Jesus providing bread in the middle of the wilderness. Well, let me now ask this question. What didn't the disciples see? Well, they failed to see how all these pieces, all these details, all these events point to the reality that Jesus is God. Now, I would suggest that's as obvious as the nose on their faces or the tool in my dad's garage or the bottle of ranch dressing in my refrigerator, and yet they obviously could not see it. They saw it, and yet they didn't really see it. But I want to make sure that we don't miss it this morning, starting with the reality that Jesus is the good shepherd. If you would, go ahead and turn with me to Ezekiel 34. It's on page 722. If you go to the middle of your Bible, you hit Psalms, then you hit the major prophets going right, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and you hit Ezekiel, Ezekiel 34. I just want to highlight this to you. Starting in verse 1, look at what Ezekiel 34 says. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God. Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed. By the way, Jesus is going to heal everyone in just a moment in our passage, right? The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. What's the result? So they were scattered. Why? Because there was no shepherd. So they are sheep without a shepherd. And so they became Food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered all over the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered all over the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. Now skip down to verse 11 and look at what God is going to do about it. Verse 11. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks his flock when he's among his sheep, they have scattered. So will I seek out my sheep and will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. 
And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture. And on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land. And on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. Look at verse 15. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. What are the disciples not seeing? Well, they're not seeing that Jesus' comment that these folks are like sheep without a shepherd immediately makes you think of Ezekiel 34, especially when Jesus immediately responds and shepherds them. Not only teaching them the good news of the gospel, so feeding them spiritually, he taught them many things, but then he feeds them physically. Bread and fish all around, and they all ate, and they all were satisfied. So these details are not just random details, but they point to the fact that Jesus is God. I mean, that's the whole point of Exodus 34. That the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the priests are so wicked that God himself will come to be the good shepherd of his sheep. Which is exactly what Jesus declares in John chapter 10. Right? He says, I am the good shepherd. And I know my own and my own know me even as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And he says this, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So Jesus is declaring he is God. But not only that he's God, but that he's happy to provide for his disciples and for us in the most significant way imaginable. Paying the debt that we owe for our sin, laying down his life, substitutionary atonement, being crucified, dead, and buried so that we might have life and have it to the fullest. The salvation of our souls. But that's not even the most obvious demonstration that Jesus is God in these verses. Go ahead and flip back to Mark chapter 6. I mean, just think about the reality that they're out in the middle of nowhere, right? Three times it says a desolate place. So they're out in the middle of the wilderness when Jesus starts handing out bread (laughs) to such an extent that the baskets never empty and everyone eats until they're stuffed, Doesn't that remind you of another story in the Bible? How about during the Exodus? When God delivers his people out of Egypt, takes them through the Red Sea and out into what? Into the wilderness. And what does he do out in the wilderness? He rains down bread from heaven. Manna for everyone. Collect as much as you want. Eat until you are satisfied, which is exactly what Jesus highlights in John chapter 6. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father. And the bread of God ultimately is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus makes it clear, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So the feeding of the 5,000 is linked with the story in Exodus. It proves that Jesus is God, not just by the miracle, but how the miracle connects to the Old Testament. So there's a context to the miracle that you need to see and understand. Miracle highlights our desperate need not just for physical food, but to have faith in Christ. Maybe you just think I'm being way too hard on the disciples. That they, they totally understand all these things, right? They get it, they see, and they really see. Am I just being hard on them? I don't think so. I think they saw these things physically, but they didn't see them spiritually. And I think that because of passages like verse 52. Just look forward a bit here in Mark chapter 6, verse 52. Mark tells us they did not understand about the lows, but their hearts were 
hardened. Jesus is even more explicit in Mark chapter 8, verse 17. You want to flip forward, you can look at that. By the way, Mark 8, 17 is after he fed the 5,000 and after he fed the 4,000. So the disciples should have totally gotten it by this point, right? There's two identical miracles. They should have understood. Disciples were, should have gotten it by then. Listen to what Jesus says, Mark 8, 17. Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets did you take up? Twelve. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets did you take up? Seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? See what I'm saying? The disciples see, but they don't see. They hear, but they don't understand. And what is it exactly that they're not understanding? They're not understanding that Jesus is God. They're not understanding that He's the Savior of the world, the promised Messiah, that He's the Good Shepherd and the Bread of Life. They're not understanding that all they need for all eternity is Him. And Jesus doesn't just feed the 5,000 to prove it. He walks on water as well. Follow along as I read. Mark chapter 6, verses 45 to 52. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Now, what did the disciples see? Well, following the feast, Jesus dismisses everyone, including the disciples, and goes up on the mountain to pray. So they immediately get into the boat, start heading back to the other side, but the wind picks up, the going gets tough, and Jesus sees that they're not getting anywhere. The making headway was painful, the text says. Now, by the way, the text gives no explanation of how Jesus knows this to be the case, but either they're so close to land that he can see them, which I think is unlikely, or he's divinely able to perceive it, which seems more likely to me. Which, by the way, would be just more evidence that Jesus is God. But the disciples obviously know they're attempting to cross the sea, but then during the fourth watch, so somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning, Jesus comes to them. Now, he doesn't rent another boat from the neighborhood marina. (laughs) He doesn't contact the local Coast Guard and catch a ride. He doesn't find a jet ski, doesn't find a hovercraft or some other seagoing vessel. No, nothing that explainable. Instead, he comes walking on the water. You know that story, but just let that sink in this morning. He comes walking on the water. That's incredible. And by the way, you need to know, attempts have been made to explain this whole thing away. Why would you want to explain it away? Because then you'd have to deal with the fact that Jesus is God. So let's explain it away. Maybe there's a sandbar. Maybe the fog is so thick, he's really not walking on the water. He's walking on the land. They're just disillusioned of where they are in the Sea of Galilee. So he's not really on the water. He's on the shore. Notice how the text says he was on the shore. Now he's walking on the sea. I would suggest Mark knows the difference between the land and the sea. text says twice he came to them walking on 
on the sea. And that's exactly what the disciples saw, which is why they're freaked out. If he was walking on the land, they wouldn't be freaked out. <laughs> He's walking on the sea. And it's so incredible that they assume he must be a ghost. That's why they're so terrified. How does Jesus respond? Compassion. He's compassionate. Compassionate to the sheep without a shepherd in the last section, now just as compassionate to his disciple. He says, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then he gets into the boat, and immediately the wind and the waves are calmed, and the disciples are, disciples are utterly astounded, which usually in the book of Mark is a good thing, but here it only highlights their hardness of heart that they're seeing but they're not really seeing. They're not really understanding. They're not really believing. They're not really looking at Jesus rightly. That's what the disciples see. Now, what didn't they see? Well, how about the fact that only God can walk on water? And that's what The miracle is designed to show us, right? I mean, listen to what the rest of the Bible teaches with regard to who can and who cannot walk on water. Job 9, verse 8 says that God alone treads on the waves of the sea. Isaiah 43 says the Lord makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters. Or how about Psalm 77, speaking about God, says when the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were terrified. Indeed, they trembled. Then verse 19, your way was through the sea, your path was through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. What are the disciples missing? They're missing that Jesus is God, that he's Yahweh in the flesh, the incarnate Son of God. And how do we know that? Because only God walks on the water. And only God passes by them. Now, that might seem like a strange phrase to you, but it's not a strange phrase at all according to the Old Testament. Look again with me at verse 48. Right? The text says, And Jesus saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And here's this strange, seemingly out-of-place phrase, And he meant to pass by them. Now, just think about that for a moment. Jesus was purposely coming to them for what reason? To help them. They're straining to make any progress. The wind's blowing, the waves are rough, and the progress is slow. So Jesus comes out somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. to help them move forward, to make progress, to actually reach land. So in light of that context, do you think it seems odd that verse 48 says he meant to walk by them? That doesn't make any sense at all. If he's coming to help them, why in the world would he pass by them? Well, the answer is that it's intentional language. It's an allusion back to the Old Testament. Passages that have everything to do with God manifesting himself to his people. How does he do that? He manifests himself, he shows himself to them by passing by them. I want to show you what I'm talking about. Go ahead and flip to Exodus 33. Genesis, Exodus, so second book in the Bible. Exodus 33, you might know this story. It's on page 74, again if you're using one of our Bibles. Passage starts in verse 18, or at least when we're going to pick it up, verse 18, with Moses declaring to God, show me your glory. Moses talking to God says, show me your glory your glory. Look at how God responds. Verse 19. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. 
Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face you shall not see. Skip down to verse 6 of chapter 34. The text says, the Lord passed before him. He passed by him. And he declares who he is. That's, that's what he's saying. Here's my name. Here's who I am. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, but who will be by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and children's children to the third and fourth generation. Look at the response of Moses, verse 8. Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth, and he worshipped. Why? Why did he worship? Because he just saw the glory of God. God passed by him. What are the disciples not seeing? They're not seeing the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ, even though he's right there in front of their faces, passing by for every single one of them to see, and yet they're not seeing it. They can't see it. They won't see it. They refuse to see it. Why? Verse 52. Is it God's fault? Is it Jesus' fault that they can't see it? No. Verse 52. Their hearts were hardened. So they're not really getting who Jesus is. They see him, but they don't see him. They hear him, but they don't really understand him. They don't really get the fact that Jesus is God incarnate. Now they might understand the words, might even be able to declare it. Like Peter, Mark 8, 29, Jesus, you are the Christ. But it's not really sinking in. The implications are not really clear. They've got all the revelatory data, but they're spiritually dull to the fact of it. They're like me standing in my dad's garage. I just can't see the tool. Or me looking in my refrigerator, missing right in front of my face. What's really scary is Mark says it's all their fault. They're responsible. It's the hardness of their heart that's the problem, which, by the way, is a very serious accusation. Jesus has already criticized his opponents for having a hard heart, Mark 3, 5. Something you'd expect from the scribes and the Pharisees or even his unbelieving family, but here it's said about his closest followers. We'll come back to that in just a moment. First, Jesus has one more confirmation for us this morning that he is God. Follow along as I read in Mark chapter 6, verses 53 to 56. One more story for us. When they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret and went moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it, were made well. Again, what do the disciples see? Well, apparently that Jesus is more popular than Tom Brady in New England, right? I mean, here it says wherever he goes, the crowds follow. Verse 54, and when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region, bringing all of the sick people wherever he went. And obviously he heals all of them. Regardless of their affliction, colds or cancer, malaria or meningitis, doesn't matter what they've got, Jesus heals them. Which is just more confirmation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he's the promised Messiah, that he is God. That is the whole purpose of the miracles, to provide confirmation that Jesus is God. So the miracles, by definition, highlight Jesus' identity. Just think with me about Matthew chapter 11. Do you remember when John the Baptist was in prison? He sent word to Jesus asking for confirmation that indeed he was the Christ, the promised Messiah. And how did Jesus respond to John the Baptist? Do you remember what he said? He said, go tell John what you hear 
and what you see, that the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news preached to them. So, so essentially, Jesus was saying to John the Baptist, John, beyond the shadow of the doubt, I am the Christ. Why? Because my healings confirm it. They prove it. They testify of my identity. But often they do far more than that, don't they? Because they point to a much greater spiritual need that we have. For example, Jesus heals a man born physically blind. That happens in John chapter 9, so that we might know our great need to see spiritually with eyes of faith. Jesus cleanses a leper, Mark chapter 1, so that we might understand that we need to be cleansed spiritually of our greatest disease, which is sin that is ravaging our bodies. Jesus heals the paralytic, Mark chapter 2, so that we might know the Son of Man has authority on earth, not only to say to a lame man, take up your bed and walk, but that he might be able to say, with authority, your sins are forgiven. I mean, do you realize that even in the book of John, the Gospel of John ends by saying, now Jesus did many other signs. He did many other miracles in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you might believe, number one, that Jesus is the Christ, that you might understand his identity. Then number two, that by believing you might have life in his name. The miracles do two things. They highlight his identity, that Jesus is God, that we might understand who he is, but secondarily, that we might respond rightly to him faith, and repentance. Notice here, Mark chapter 6, how the healings are available to anyone who believes enough just to touch his garment. Verse 56 says, and as many as touched it were made well. You need to understand that this isn't some sort of magic trick. This isn't some sort of hocus pocus actions. No, what we're seeing here, right, and we've seen it before with the women who was hemorrhaging for 12 years, Jesus makes it clear, right? What is it that made her well? It was her faith. It was the object of her faith, trusting that in Christ she could be healed. Rather, you put that in contrast, with the hardness of the disciple's heart. See, it has everything to do with how you respond to Jesus, not just in his identity, although it's absolutely essential that you understand he is God, but his deity, the fact that he is God, only proves that he has the ability to forgive us of our sins. That's why it's critical. So my question this morning as we close is do you have eyes to see Jesus? Do you have eyes to see Jesus rightly? To see Jesus for who he really is? Or do you see him and yet not really see him? Do you see his glory and his grace and the salvation that he comes to bring for you specifically? Or are you still dull to that reality? Are your eyes blinded from seeing the glory of the gospel in the face of Jesus Christ? Because if they are, you need to understand the issue is not God's issue. See, I think that's where we're prone to go. I think we run to the reality and we blame God. Well, if God would just make it obvious to me, then I would see it. That's not what our passage says this morning. The issue is not God. The issue is the hardness of your heart. The evidence is right here in front of you if you'll just respond to it. Seeing what it's trying to show you, the issue is not God but the hardness of your heart. If that's you this morning, then I want to appeal to you to do something crazy, a little bit out of the norm. I want to appeal to you to ask God to show you your sin. You're not really seeing him for who he is. And I'm suggesting that that's the hardness of your heart. So I'm appealing to you to ask God to show you your sin.
Why would I ask you to do that? Well, because Jesus didn't come to heal the healthy. He came to heal the the sick. And since you don't seem to understand just how spiritually sick you are, you don't see your need for Jesus. You don't see him as the great physician of your soul. Instead, you think you're all set. I don't need him. But you're not all set. You're not seeing rightly. You're blind to the sin that's eating you alive from the inside out. So I appeal to you to ask God to show you the reality of your sin. Because it's only when you see the reality of your sin that the cross of Christ makes any sense at all. It's only when you see your sin that Christ dying for your sin becomes sweet and wonderful and beautiful. Because it's only when you see your sin that you will cry out in desperation, Jesus, save me. And the only way he can save you is if he's actually God. Will you take me up on that suggestion? It's easy to say, I'd love to know God and I'd love to believe these things are true. And yet, what are you doing about that? There's things that you can do. You can appeal, oh God, Help me to see the reality of my sin that I might glory in my Savior. I appeal to do that even today. Spiritual dullness, however, isn't just a problem for unbelievers or those who are seeking. The disciples were dull and hard-hearted this morning, so while seeing, they did not see. Spiritually speaking, they missed it all. So please understand that believers can be just as dull and distracted with hearts that are hard and eyes that are dim from seeing the glory of the gospel in the face of Jesus Christ. We're just as prone to move in that direction. And one very obvious reason for why that is. Because we still have sin in our life. And often, there's unrepentant sin which makes total sense, doesn't it? I mean, if you're repeatedly giving yourself over to sin and not repenting of it, that's certainly going to result in spiritual dullness. I mean, nothing will throw blindfold over your eyes of your heart quicker than sin. Nothing dulls your spiritual senses quicker than the muck and the mire of ungodliness. Sin makes reading your Bible seem boring. Sin makes singing in worship feel flat. Sin makes prayer feel rote and ridiculous like you're throwing words up that are bouncing off the ceiling. And sin makes attending church seem like a chore. Why? Because sin makes you dull and distracted. And it hardens your heart. So dear believer, if you've got any unrepentant sin in your life, I'm appealing to you to resolve it right here, right now, this morning. Asking God to forgive you. Committing this morning that you're going to walk in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. So that you might glory in the reality that God became man for our salvation. That's why it's so critical that Jesus is God. He has to be God. He's got to be 100% God and he's got to be 100% man in order for him to accomplish our salvation. It's proven over and over in the Bible. You're probably going to get bored with it over the next couple of weeks because he just over and over and over keeps proving to us that he's God. He feeds the 5,000, then he's going to feed the 4,000. Why do you think he does that? Because we're dull and distracted. We need to be reminded that Jesus is God so that we can glory in our salvation. Just like we often sing here at Proclamation, O great God of highest heaven, occupy my lowly heart, own it all and reign supreme, conquer every rebel power. Let no vice or sin remain that resists your holy war. You have loved and purchased me. 
Make me yours forevermore. May God give us the grace to see Jesus for who he really is this morning. God who became man, lived a perfect life, died a sinner's death so that he could purchase our salvation for all eternity. Praise God that Jesus is God. Let's pray. Father, even as we pray and think about the things that we've just heard, we're prone to think, yeah, I already know that. He fed the 5,000. He walked on water. He healed everyone who came to him. I got it. And yet, Father, in such a profound way, we don't see that as clearly as we ought to this morning. And so, Father, I'm asking that you would just do a good work, that you would use these words to penetrate our hearts, that we would be overwhelmed, undone, by the fact that God became man and dwelt among us, that Jesus is God. And yet he willingly died for our sin. Father, I pray that that would capture our hearts anew this morning. That indeed, we would live our lives for your glory. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.